to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This morning, if you're taking note, the title of the message is pretty simple. It's just simply Arise. Can you guys say Arise? Arise. arise. That was good. Very good. Arise. And we're going to be looking here. Jesus, uh, we're going through this kind of series. Uh, chapter 8 and 9 is, is power for today. And the question we've been asking is, does Jesus have enough power to, to do miracles and change lives today? And I hope as we're studying through it that you're leaving with the reality, which is certainly, yes, he certainly does. Jesus has enough power to change lives, to touch people, to heal marriages. Maybe you're here and you're wondering, can the Lord forgive me of the sin I've committed? Maybe it's, there's just an attitude of your heart you've been wrestling with, wondering if God's going to set you free. This morning we're going to look, Jesus is going to say to a paralyzed man, arise. And I believe he would say it to each in every single one of us here today, he would say, arise, arise. So Matthew chapter nine, our Bible should be open. Let's settle our hearts. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to meet us here. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we are just so thankful, Lord, that you have changed so many lives. God, that we are part of the, 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 the body of Christ and Lord, what a miracle that is, Lord. What a miracle of your spirit that you have done to change lives, Lord. You've done miracles, Lord, we've experienced. Lord, we've seen in the scriptures, Lord, the record of when you were on this earth, how you healed and touched so many. And God, today we pray, Lord, as we study about and we read about this paralyzed man that you touched, Lord, for each and every individual here, that, Lord, we would find ourselves coming alive, Lord, that we would arise, that we would find new life in Christ, and we would walk in it today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 9. Now, we're going to talk about arising. And because of that, I, I was thinking about my three kids. You know, one of my main jobs as of dad is to wake up my children. You know, now sometimes I'm out of the house before they're awake. But often when I wake them up, it's really interesting. Because the way I, I wake up each one of them, I'm going to be honest, it's different. You know, for one of them, I can go up to them and I could say, good morning. And that little soft word, the, a smile will come on their face. They'll open their eyes. You guys are figuring that's the youngest one, which you'd be correct. And they'll smile and they'll say, ah, daddy. And that's what a blessing, right? That's a way to wake them. Now, another one of them, I got to say, good morning. Time to get up, and I got to give them a little, just a little, little love, you know, kind of a little push there. Time to get up. They'll wake up. Now, to the other one, I could sit there all morning and say, good morning, and they'd be sleeping, right? I could say, good morning, time to get up. They'd be sleeping. So what do I have to do? I just push them right out the bed. Boom, throw it on the floor. They wake right up. Listen, for you and I, it kind of goes like that. You know, what about you? What does the Lord have to do in your life? To wake you up sometimes. You know, we live in a day where, and we're going to see it in the, the scriptures here with Jesus, there's a tremendous need. You know, one of the things that was evident in the Gospels was that people needed Jesus. You know, how many of you guys have a need for Jesus even now? Yeah? You know, even after you're saved, we still need him. It's not like all of a sudden we grow out of it. We get saved and then we say, we kind of shake the Lord's hand and we go, Lord, you've done enough now. Now it's my turn. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. It doesn't work like that. But we live in an age where a lot of the people that surround us, a lot of people in this world, have an idea in their minds that they don't need Jesus. That almost mankind has figured out the way to bring about, you know, a pseudo Shangri-La amongst us. And I've talked to people recently that are basically saying, you know, we don't really need the Bible. We don't need Jesus. We figured it out. And I found myself, I don't know if you guys have been there, scratching my head wondering, what? Really? Now, this past week, I was, you know, made the grave mistake of reading the local newspaper. And I was, I was there. I was waiting to get a haircut. I'm kind of just reading the newspaper. And I get to the Dear Abby section. How many of you guys ever read the Dear Abby section? How many of you guys have noticed how radically it's changed, right? It used to be like, my child Johnny is learning how to ride his bike. When should I take the, tri the, the you know, the, what do they ever call them? You know, the training wheels off. I, re I hope, this is the local newspaper. Some of you guys are like, 
You've been sharing radical things. I'm just sharing what's happening in the world, guys. You guys ready for this? Put your seatbelt on. Dear Abby, I am a transgender female who is working on my marriage to my wife of 41 years. First of all, I'm sitting in the barbershop. I, my jaw drops, the newspaper falls, and I'm like this. The guys are like, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, I'm just reading Dear Abby. We have had our ups and downs during the course of our marriage. We have two sons and eight beautiful grandchildren. All of them know about my transition to womanhood, and my family also knows. What I need now is some advice to help our marriage. We are strongly committed to working on it. Now, I'm not going to read a response because it's equally as crazy. But can I say to you, guys, we live in a day where God's people, church, listen, we need to arise. We have to walk with the Lord. We need to be touched by Jesus, just like this paralyzed man. We live in a day where man is, is convinced that we're all good people. And the, the truth of the matter is, whether the Lord can whisper in our ear to get us up, whether he has to get a stern voice. But maybe this morning, the God of the Bible has to come over to some of us and just push us right off the bed. And we need a good thump to wake up. Because we need to wake up. We do. We have to wake up. What about you? You know, today I ask you this, and I ask it lovingly. Are you awake today spiritually? Or are you sleeping? Are you more awake today spiritually than you've ever been before? You know, as we move into the text, ask yourself this question. It's healthy every now as a child of God. Paul, even the apostles said that we should examine ourselves to say whether we are in the faith, right? And ask yourself, if not, if I'm not awake, what is holding me back? You know, I think for some of us, it just might be fear, I think some of us, we get saved, we begin to read our Bible, we start to follow Jesus, and then we go, wait a second, if I get too serious with God, what is he gonna do with my life? He might one day whisper in my ear and say, I want you to go and share the gospel in Antarctica, and I can't do it. And we get afraid, you know, I love this story. It's of um, what holds you back. I've shared this before. Black Bart was a professional thief whose very name struck fear as he terrorized the Wells Fargo stage line. From San Francisco to New York, his name became synonymous with the danger of the frontier. Between 1875 and 1883, he robbed 29 different stagecoach crews. Amazingly, Bart did it all without firing one shot. Because a hood hit his face, no victim ever saw his face. He never took a hostage. It was never trailed by a sheriff. Instead, Black Bart used fear to paralyze his victims. His sinister presence was enough to overwhelm the toughest stagecoach guard. You know, this morning, what is holding you back? If you're not arised, like if you're not awake in your walk with the Lord, what is it that's holding you back? Is it fear today? Could it be fear? I think for many of us, it just might be. Maybe it's not fear for you. But maybe it's priorities. You know, maybe it's priorities. Maybe you say, you know, I want to arise. I want to get real with God. I want to walk with the Lord like I should spiritually. But so many things, so many activities seem to crowd Jesus out, right? I have good intentions, but by the time I get to the Lord, I open my Bible and I find myself snoozing in the scriptures. Listen, it could be priorities. Uh, I love this story. A group of friends went deer hunting and paired off in twos for the day. That night, one of the hunters returned alone, staggering under an eight-pound, an eight-point buck. Where's Harry, he, at, he was asked. Well, he said Harry had a stroke of some kind. He's a couple of miles back up the trail. They looked at him. They said, you left Harry laying there and carried the deer back? The guy said, well, you know, said the hunter, I figured no one was going to steal Harry, they said. You know, it's so true, guys. We, we find ourselves getting priorities out of whack. We're like, you know, I'd follow the Lord, but my wife or my husband or my children or my boss or my neighbor, maybe it's priorities. Maybe that's what's keeping you from arising. Or maybe it's not you, it's fear, priorities. Maybe it's just simply bad habits. Maybe you say, I want to, but I just have some really bad habits. I found myself just getting used to kind of doing this in the morning or doing that as opposed to seeking the Lord. Listen, whatever it is this morning that's holding you back, if it's fear, if it's priorities, if it's bad habits, or maybe for you, 
like it was for this paralyzed man in the scripture here in Matthew chapter 9. Maybe it was guilt. Maybe it's feeling like you're not forgiven. Maybe it's a desire saying, Lord, I know you're calling me. I know you love me. But the things I've done, I don't think they're forgivable. Maybe that's you. Whatever it is, guys, listen, Jesus would say to you and I today, it's time to arise. And we're going to see this with this man, this paralyzed man here in Matthew chapter 9. So Matthew chapter 9, we're going to begin in verse 1. Remember, Jesus had just healed this demon-possessed man. He had cast out this demon uh, powerfully. Now, the, 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 the demon-possessed man wants to stay with him, but the people want him to go. We, we pick it up, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. It says, so Jesus got into a boat, and he crossed over. This is the Sea of Galilee that he crosses over, and he came to his own city. If you have your pen, you could circle that phrase, his own city. It's not Nazareth, it's Capernaum. Jesus is staying with Peter there. Verse 2, it says, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now, the first point we're going to see this morning in terms of a rise, right? Does Jesus have enough power to not only save us, but to lift us up, to bring us to what he has for us in our walk with the Lord? Number one, church, we need to learn if we're going to rise to retreat to refreshment. You have to learn how to retreat to refreshment refreshment. What do I mean by that? This life is pretty difficult. I mean, how many guys have had, you know, maybe this past week has been a difficult week. How many guys here? Yeah. The rest of you guys obviously are lying. We know the truth, right? You know, it's a, it's a challenge just to get up. You know, God bless all you guys that travel down to New York City. You know, every time I have to do anything down there, I always pray for you because I don't know how you do it. You know, I would just, I would need to spend three, four, five hours in prayer in the word every single morning, you know, because I'm on my way home going, these people can't be this crazy, right? Like, how do you get driver's licenses? I don't understand. I guess they just give them out now. But we need to retreat to refreshment. You know, unless you are going to be that person that wakes up and just stays in your house and turns the curtains and doesn't talk to anybody. And I know some of you are tempted right now going, yes, that's the life I'm looking for. It, it won't bless you. We have to retreat to refreshment. What does that look like? Even for Jesus here, he goes to Gadara. We looked at it at the end of chapter 8 last week. He deals with this demon-possessed man that, that nobody could deal with. He casts him out. And you're going to imagine these people are going to respond, you know, celebrating it and glorifying God. But what did we see last week? We watched what happened. They came to him and they begged Jesus to leave. Because remember, the demon had asked, send me into a herd of pigs. And their pigs had run off the cliff. Now they had lost what was, what was their merchandise. They didn't care about the man who Jesus healed. And now they begged Jesus to leave. And you know, Jesus, he does that. You know, Jesus leaves Gadara. If you and I want Jesus to go, listen, he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's not going to forsake us, but he will allow sin to have its way in our lives. He will do that. And I'll say it's for our own good. You know, as parents, some of us, maybe you understand. I've done it before. You know, all my kids will ask me how to do something and then I'll watch how they're doing it and they're not, you know, they kind of, I'm going, I think he may have asked me just for fun, you know. They go to do it and now they're struggling and suffering. And there are times where I'll look on and I'll say, you know what, you're old enough now. You asked me how to do it. I told you, you're kind of doing it your own way. And I'll let the process play out. Not because I'm trying to be mean or trying to be cruel, but I'm, I want them to learn. Listen, you, you know, there's, there's wise ways to do things. You know, the Lord here, as the people of Gatera ask him to leave, Jesus leaves. He leaves. And it says he goes to his own city. We looked at this. This is Capernaum. You're going to see this throughout the Gospels. Jesus often will be in the city called Capernaum. It's on the Sea of Galilee. We've been seeing it over and over again. This is where Peter lived. Jesus kind of found a, a, a pseudo home around the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum. When he goes down south to, uh, to Jerusalem, his pseudo home will be at the home of Mary and Martha in Bethany. That's kind of how the Lord did it. He didn't have his own place, but he had a place where people would invite him in. You know, where do you retreat to? Mom, dad, where do you retreat to? Grandma, grandpa, teenager, college student, where do you go when you need refreshment? You know, is it... Oh, man, can't wait to get Netflix on, right? 
Amazon Prime. I don't know what else is out there now, but, right? Are you kind of behind the controller or just kind of, and there's, there's a place for that at times. But the refreshment church that we need, scripture, God tells the believer, can I say this? It's the Lord. We need to retreat to the Lord. And the place that we retreat to is honestly the body of Christ. It's the church. We, we should be able to gather together. And can I say this? As we grow as believers in Jesus and as we grow as a church body and community, we should be encouraging each other. You know, I, I want to encourage you. Realize there are, there are times where, where we do have to say, you know, I love you. And we give a little bit of correction. But can I say this should be the, the, the lesser part. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, and it's, it's where Paul tells us in Hebrews to not neglect the gathering of ourselves together. It's Hebrews 10. Look at this, verse 24. He says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. You know, the whole chapter is about how difficult it is to be a Christian and be in this world. And because of that, we need to be able to come to the body of Christ and find refreshment. Be encouraged, right? Hear somebody say, I got it. You know, I know you're struggling in this area, but be encouraged. The Lord is for you, right? God will deal with you. You know, maybe your friend or your spouse is kind of tired of you, but God is not. And I'm thankful for that, you know. I really, truly am. I'm thankful for that. And we need to find refre re refreshment refreshment in that and set that example uh, for our family. So let's move on. So Jesus goes to his own city, verse two, then behold, they brought to him, it says a paralytic lying on a bed. So this is a paralyzed man. It says, when Jesus saw, it says, their faith, he said to the paralytic, he said, son, be of good courage. And look at this, if you have your pen, underline it, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Number two, if you're taking note, it's simply build a home, not a house. Build a home, not a house. And I'm not just talking about in the family context. I'm talking about in your own life, right? You see, when you and I say yes to Jesus Christ, what happens there is we actually invite Jesus to come inside. We say, Lord, you come in and you change out the furnishings, you change things in me. Lord, I want you to take out that old lazy boy recliner that's been in my living room for 40 years. I want you to bring in what you want. You know, I want you to take out this and take out that. But, and you know what's great about the Lord? He does it gently and he does it in his time. And it's always the right time. But God's interested not just in building a shiny house or a big house, but he's interested in building a home in us, a real home, a place that's real, a place where there's genuine transaction of relationship. And the Bible here tells us there in verse two that this paralytic is brought to Jesus. And I want you to notice this. If you have your pen underlined, it says, when Jesus saw their faith. Now here in Matthew's gospels, we only get part of the story. In the gospel of Mark chapter two, we get a little bit more detail about what happens here. Mark chapter 2, you'll see it up on the screen. We begin in verse 2. It says, Immediately many gathered together. This is at Peter's house. <clears throat> so that there was no longer room to receive them. So the place is so packed, there's no room for anybody else to get in. Not even near the door. And Jesus preached the word to them, verse 3. Then they came to him, look it, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So this paralyzed man didn't have much, but he had four friends still. He had four people that cared about him enough. Verse four, it says, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, as a homeowner, I'm getting nervous as I'm reading this, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And once again, Mark says, when Jesus saw their faith. I want you to notice here, Jesus here doesn't speak about the paralyzed man's faith. This paralyzed man who had been a paralytic for quite some time, he, not only did he not have faith, he was kind of depressed. There was darkness in his soul, man. He's being dragged there. His four friends put him on this basically a stretcher, and they're like, we're bringing you to Jesus whether you like it or not. And I picture this guy going, no, Jesus isn't real, right? I believe in, you know, in evolution. Who knows what he's saying, you know? There's no God. 
Right? I don't understand. I'm in this pain. And they bring him. And now they get there. The place is packed. They're like, of course there'd be a line at the door for Jesus, right? Of course. You know, how many of you guys here enjoy waiting in line? Yes, a lot of you? Oh, not many takers. You know, if you do, it's kind of weird. You know, I'll be honest. You know, nobody likes waiting in line. I mean, whether it's on the freeway or at a checkout line, whatever it is, you know, you're looking, where can I go? You know, when I go to the grocery store, you know, I'm like, ah, I tell the kids, you know, my son, he's a real stickler. He really is. He's like, Dad, it says eight items. We have nine. <laughs> I'm like, well, then put back the thing you picked out. You know, that's what I tell him. I tell him, I just tell him the truth. Well, that's no problem. We'll, go, we'll fix this really quick, you know. But it's amazing, you know, there's this line, and what do these men do as four friends? They bring them up on the roof. Now imagine, you know, for you folks, you families that are involved in ministry, this is what it looks like. Think about this. You had this great idea. I'm going to host a home Bible study with Jesus. And now everybody's there. And now all of a sudden, you're, you're what, you know, I'm picturing Mrs. Peter looking, going, what is that guy doing ripping the shingles off my roof, right? Oh, then he breaks through the roof, and you're going... You know, that's what ministry, that's what happens, you know. The Lord will even test you with that. I've seen him many times. You know, test you with your stuff, right? With the stuff. You know, how, how tightly you're going to hang on to it. You know, you want to go on with the Lord, our resources start to become the Lord. So is it, uh, is it Dale Moody or Martin Luther? He says you, you'll tell the extent of a man's real faith when you look at his checkbook, basically. I think he called it his purse, though. But I'm not going to say it today because we already got enough of that stuff in the church. So, But you look and see where it's going, the resources. For Mrs. Peter, she's watching her house get destroyed. She probably had just got back from, you know, home goods and fixed it up. And now there's a hole in the roof. And this man's being lowered down. There's dirt all over the floor. Jesus is there. All these people, they didn't wipe their feet at the door. She's probably looking at Peter going, Peter, no good. But God is, there's something happening here. You know, the Lord will do this in our lives. He'll ask us, do you want a home or do you want a house? Do you want stuff or do you want the peace of God? Do you want the love of God? You want the things that promote health, the things that kids catch on to and bless their hearts. What do you want? And these four guys come. They don't wait in the line. They go on the roof. They pretty much offend Mrs. Peter here. But Jesus here tells us that he recognizes their faith. You know, sometimes in the body of Christ, there's ideas that surface that someone is sick and the reason why they're not healed is because they don't have enough faith. I'm going to tell you here, interestingly enough, if you want to take that way of thinking, Jesus basically tells us he recognized the men's faith who brought the paralytic to Jesus. So in that line of thinking, we could actually say, you know, the reason why that person's not healed is because you, Mr. or Mrs. Healer, don't have enough faith. But it's not that. You know, faith is not a feeling. If you're taking note, jot it down. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, it's kind of interesting. God in his infinite wisdom knew that man would kind of abuse what faith really is. So he gave us an exact definition of it. You'd be wise to mark this in your Bible and learn this. Hebrews 11 verse 1, the Bible says, now faith is, so we don't have to guess, right? Faith is the substance. Can you guys say substance? substance? The substance of things hoped for in the evidence. Can you say evidence? evidence? It's the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you're there, I want you to underline every time you see in verse 1 the word feelings. Just go ahead and underline that for me. Oh, it's not there. See, what is faith? Faith is the substance and the evidence. How do we know these men had great faith? Because they were in the town square going, I've got great faith. No. It's because they did everything they possibly could to get this paralyzed man to Jesus. And Jesus looked and he said, you get it. I don't even picture, I don't think these men had enough time to talk. Because I think they were walking. And they were walking and they were bringing their broken friend to Jesus. Do you know, church, that's what we need to do. Simplify this thing. A little less talking, a little more walking, right? That's what faith looks like. It looks like us living our identity as a child of God at our workplace, you know, and kind of just loving the Lord and being a Christian and not allowing the culture to dictate to us 
what we are going to be or what we're not going to be. We live for the Lord. We walk with the Lord. We walk in that. And for these men, they, they genuinely had real faith. Now look what Jesus says to this paralyzed man. He says to him, and if you have your pen, you can underline it back in Matthew chapter nine there. He says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now this is interesting. Jesus says to this paralyzed man, and I want you to imagine this. This man has been paralyzed, very likely from his neck down, Bible scholars tell us. This man has been paralyzed. He's brought to Jesus. He's lowered down through the roof. Jesus looks at him. And Jesus smiles, looks at him and says, bud, he says, son, cheer up. He says, why, why are you frowning? What's the problem? Why is there darkness over your life? But I want you to notice what he says, but I also want you to notice what he doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say to this paralyzed man, be healed. Jesus says, be cheerful. Your sins are forgiven you. Imagine this. Some of us, some in the church today, would almost call this being cruel. <laughs> this guy is paralyzed. His friends bring him to him. And all Jesus says is, your sins are forgiven you? It can almost be perceived as being cruel, but it's not cruel. Why? Guys, a couple things. Why does Jesus say this? Why does Jesus talk to this man about his sins before he talks to this man about his sickness? A couple things. Number one, if you're taking note, understand this. In Judaism at that time, and I'm going to tell you this, I see this idea sometimes in the body of Christ today. In Judaism at the time, there was an idea that if you had a disease or a sickness, it was because there was sin in your life. I've heard it in the church, usually from the most carnal Christians that I know. It's kind of crazy. They come, you think the person got sick because they're prideful? And I'm going, dude, if that's true, you're definitely getting sick, you know. It, it, it was around back then. It's around today. There was an idea that sickness was evidence of not being right with God. And somewhere along the line, there's many of us, we think these things. In the Old Testament, the book of Job, one of Job's, and I say this loosely, friends, came and ministered to him. His name was Eliphaz. And Eliphaz, in Job's condition, Job chapter 4, verse 7, basically says to Job, whoever, he says to him, whoever perished being innocent, he basically says, Job, there must be something you're not telling us, and that's why you're really going through this. And it just wasn't true in the case of Job. Can I say, church, that is a, that's an immature way of looking at things. And I also would say, it's not helpful. It's not helpful. That's not our job description. Jesus never said, this is what I want you to do. You go out, you be God, and I'll be you. He never said that. He wants us to go out and share the gospel, love people, and let him be the Holy Spirit and do the, the convicting and do those things. And we need to be open to that. You see, Jesus, I believe, is saying this to this paralytic because there was an idea that, that had kind of rested over his life, that it was a universal fact that if you were righteous, you wouldn't suffer like this. So because you're suffering like this, you're not righteous. And that's the wrong thinking. And Jesus looks at him, and I think Jesus sees past all the crowd, and he deals with this issue so well, as only Jesus could. The second reason I think Jesus tells him this first is, what was it that this man needed more than anything else? You know, sometimes for us, we look at a physical well-being as the priority in our lives. But God looks at us and he looks at our heavenly destination and our spiritual condition as the priority. You see, even here at Calvary Chapel, kind of one of our little identifiers is we love to reach people. We love to help others. You know, we collect the backpacks and try to do as much as we can to reach out. But one of our characteristics is whatever we're going to do, we want to see the gospel attached to it. And some would say, well, you know, it's not really necessary. And I would say even here in this text, we see Jesus saying, listen, I'm going to heal this man. But before I heal him, I want to bring healing spiritually. You know, what is the benefit if we feed a man, if we clothe him, if we heal him, just to see him not know the truth and go into eternity Christless? There's no benefit. 
You know, if we say we love someone, can I say, there, there comes a point in our lives where we have to communicate the gospel with them. This is a challenge, you know. Kind of live in a church age where there's an idea, all right, I'm just gonna, and, and it is good. We should live it. We should be living it, guys. I'm not saying, listen, you're out there, you know, you make, uh, you, you know, you're not living for the Lord. Talking about Jesus, probably not gonna be a lot of fruit attached to that. But if you're living for the Lord, there comes a point where we have to say, hey, you know, mind if we go out to lunch? Can I take you out to lunch? You take him to lunch, you say, listen, I'm not trying to beat you over the head with the Bible, but, you know, do you have a religious background, anything about eternity? And you begin to share. You, you'd be surprised what happens. It's really not as complicated as you think it is. You know, whether it be a mom, a dad, a brother, sister, you know, friends, there, there is that responsibility for us as God's kids to bring the gospel. And Jesus, even faced with a paralytic whose friends really brought him to Jesus to heal him, Jesus says to him, I want you to know your sins are forgiven. I want you to know that I forgive you. I want you to know that I have power to do that. And it's important uh, that, we, that we do that as well. Uh, I believe it's so important, even today, as the church, that we bring the gospel to people, that we share the gospel. If you're taking out Romans chapter 10, and I know that this kind of goes against what some people would say, Romans 10, verse 14 and 15, the Bible says, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, how is our neighbor or our coworker, right, or our best friend gonna understand the gospel if we don't share it with them? That doesn't mean we beat them over the head or we corner them or we, we, we say, hey, come take a drive with me. And we drive to some obscure field somewhere. You know, that's just weird. You know, somebody asked me this week, uh, like a doctrinal question. I said, you ready for a real theological understanding? I said, listen, if it's weird, you know what that means? It's weird. That's what it means. Like Jesus didn't really do that many weird things. He loved people and shared the truth. So the paralytic comes, Jesus tells him, your sins are forgiven. Let's move on. Verse three. And it says, and at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. Verse four, look at this. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, <laughs> why do you think evil in your hearts? Now, number three, if you're taking note in terms of a rise, number one was retreat to refreshment. Number two is build a home, not a house. Number three is don't have a divided mind. You know, don't have a divided mind. Some of us miss out on Jesus or miss out on moving forward Jesus or don't simply just respond to him saying to us, son, it's time to get up. Daughter, it's okay. I forgive you. Get up. Some of the reason why is because we have a divided mind. The scribes here who were learners, who were educated, who were documenting things, it says some of the scribes said within themselves. Now I want you to notice this, where they said this. The scribes didn't shout across the room and say, hey Mordecai, did you hear what he just said? Jesus blasphemes. That's not what happened, right? What happened? It says they said it within themselves. And Jesus knew. You know, that's kind of a scary thing. Imagine being around somebody that knew what you were thinking. I wouldn't want to be around that person too often, you know? They'd be like, why did you say that about me? You're like, oh no, I was just kidding in my mind, you know? You know? It's amazing, but that was Jesus. Jesus does that. You know, with you and I, he knows these things. He knows it. And Jesus said to the scribes, why do you think evil in your heart? Why do you think evil in your heart? You know, I think that's a question we have to allow Jesus to ask each and every one of us. We have to let him ask us that. You know, I think often we think, all right, you know, I'm going to really look Christian today. It's, all right, Sunday. <sighs> you know, it's, maybe I'm just talking to myself. The rest of you guys, you guys are so good, so it's not like that for you. But, but the Lord, he says, I'm, I don't look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. You know, it's something I love about kids. I love it about children. Especially, you know, the, the younger ones. Is they will tell you exactly what they're thinking. You know, won't they? They'll, they'll tell you what's happening. The other night, my wife and I, we went to this restaurant 
And uh, our bigger ones were at youth ministry on Friday, so we usually take that as an opportunity to go out to eat, so it costs less, you know, it's simple, simple math. And uh, we went to this restaurant we wanted to try, it was like a Vietnamese place, and they have this, this interesting type of soup, and we brought our little one, so we sit her down, and we're eating, it was it's really good, by the way, I would encourage you, I was talking to my wife, how are not more people going to these places, it's so good. But my daughter didn't apparently think so because uh, we put some in her bowl. She started to eat it. As she ate it, her mouth kind of just stayed open. She leaned over and just let it fall out on the floor, you know. It was kind of like, what, what do you think? Do you like it, honey? You know, no. She, you didn't have to wonder, what is she thinking? Does she like it? She did it. She didn't like it. How do you know? Because it was obvious. You know, as we get older and we mature, we start to internalize these things. And people around us may not know, but Jesus here tells us, he shows us with his relationship with the scribes, he knows, he sees it. He goes, you know, I know you're struggling with that person, that guy, that gal, but you know, I love them and I see it. You know, in our minds, they can get divided. For you note takers, jot this down, Psalm 139, verse 23 through 24. I believe that, David, even in his brokenness, and if you're with us on Wednesday nights, you know we've been going through 2 Samuel, and we've seen this man after God's own heart fall terribly. But even in his brokenness, I believe David learned something very profound that you and I could learn. It's Psalm 139, verse 23 through 24. He says, search me, O God. And he says, know my heart, right? And then he says, try me and know my anxieties. This Hebrew word for anxieties means a divided mind. He says, Lord, try me and know when my mind is divided, when part of me is believing you and saying, God, you can handle this and I'm forgiven, but then another part of me is just filled with fear and worry and anxiety. Lord, try me and know when I'm allowing these thoughts to kind of rest in my mind. And he says, and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, I believe that David here by the Holy Spirit is giving us an insight into, the, into the, 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 the beginning of sin in our lives. The beginning of you and I drifting or moving off course or getting angry or falling in lust. I believe David here by the Spirit is giving us an insight and it has to do with fear and anxiety. In this culture, anxiety is almost, it's just part of life. It's almost like you could go and just say, hi, my name is, and I am an anxious person. And it's like, I get it, I'm an anxious person too. Wow, right? And I get it, apart from Jesus, I would be very anxious too. But I, I, wanted, I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't tell you what the Bible says about this. Philippians chapter four, some of you guys know this verse. Philippians four, Paul says, verse six, he says, be anxious for some things. Nothing. No. Some of you guys, if you're falling asleep, it says nothing up there, right? <laughs> be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And look at this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you and I allow anxious thoughts to just begin to rest in our minds, I believe the Bible there in Psalm 139, I believe God is giving David an insight. It is literally an open door for sin to come in. Because we don't realize, listen, if, if our God genuinely created the heavens and the earth in six days, if in, a, if in a six hour period on a cross outside of Jerusalem, Jesus Christ paid for every one of our sins here today, past, present, and future, then when Paul says to us, listen, church, be anxious for nothing, we have to say yes and amen. We have to begin to realize if I choose to be anxious, it's because I'm choosing to be anxious. It's not actually because I have anything to be anxious about. Some of you are going, Pastor, you don't know. You don't know my life. You don't know where I come from. You don't know the sin of my past. Well, Jesus looks at this paralyzed man and he says, cheer up. He says, cheer up. I'm going to do something here. I'm going to do something. <laughs> and does the Lord. Look what happens next. 
Back to Matthew chapter 9, verse 5. It says, for which is easier to say? So now Jesus, he's not just going to do a work in this man's life, but he's going to do a work in everybody's life around this man. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? <laughs> verse 6, it says, but, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise. He says, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Verse 7, it says, And he arose and departed to his house. And it says, Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Now we're going to wrap up on this one, but I definitely want to dig into it. Number four, if you're taking note in terms of arise, number four is realize that Jesus did the hardest thing, guys. It's so important that you and I realize this. Jesus Christ already did the hardest thing. He already did it. Let's, let's answer the question that Jesus asks here, right? He, he asks a question. He says, which is harder? Or, or which is easier to say? And, you know, I would suppose it's easier to say, right, your sins are forgiven. Because you could tell somebody, your sins are forgiven, and they do that in some religious circles, and really, there's no way to prove that, right? It's internal change. So I suppose it would be easier to say your sins are forgiven, but it's only because we can't see the, the, the process. You know, you can say to anyone, you know, how can you prove it? And it would be harder to say, take up your bed and walk. Why? Because if the person doesn't, you're a big fraud, right? You're a fraud, if that person doesn't get up at that moment. And Jesus asks them this question for a reason. He's trying to get them to really think about this. Like you're, you're concerned that I told this paralyzed man your sins are for, forgiven, but there's a reason why. You see, this is the point. Church, if you're taking note, jot this down. Both are impossible for human beings. Neither one of these can be done by man. Neither one of us can heal a person and neither one of us, none of us here, can forgive a person, can flip the switch and see somebody saved. Both are impossible for men, but both are possible for God. Understand that. That's what Jesus is trying to help them understand. You guys think you can forgive sin. You guys think by the law and by your traditions, you're going to go to heaven. But Jesus here is telling them, not only can you not heal this paralyzed man, but you can't forgive man of their sins either. But I can. I can. Jesus says, I can. And he tells them there that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Jesus wanted everyone there to know that he had the power to forgive everyone of their sins. Take a moment. Jesus has the power to forgive everyone of their sins. That word power there, it's exousia. It literally means like jurisdiction. Jesus has the right. He has the power. He has the authority to forgive man of their sins. You know, in this culture, there are many, as Jesus warned us about in Matthew 24, that would come in his name as a savior and claim to be able to save people or help people. World religions. But the Bible tells us only Jesus has the power to forgive sins. You know, I think a good illustration would be, let's say you're in prison, and I hope that over none of you. But let's say you're in prison, and a friend of yours comes to visit, and you're talking, and all of a sudden they pull out a piece of paper, and on the top of it, it says, presidential pardon. And they tell you, listen, I made this on Microsoft Word, you know. It's got all the language. I found one online. I just copied the language. It looks pretty legit. And at the bottom, they pulled out a nice, you know, beautiful pen, and they signed it. You know, if you took that presidential pardon that your friend had signed, and you bring it to the ward, and you say, you know, sir, I'm free. He's going to laugh at you. I don't know what he's going to do, actually, but it's not going to be good. You're not getting free. Because only the president has the authority, the exousia, the jurisdiction to do that. Church, listen. Listen. Jesus is here telling these people, he's showing them 
that he has the power to forgive us of our sins. Guys, if you're here today and you're still going before God, going, Lord, I feel so unworthy. Back in 1987, Lord, the Lord is looking at you going, I have the power to forgive your sin and I've forgiven it. It has been dealt with. It has been cast as far as the east is from the west. And you and I need to exhibit a little faith in this area and walk in that and realize I'm forgiven. It's over. Jesus is taking care of it. And it's important that we do. It really is. Jesus can forgive you. He can change you. And he can help you and I to walk again. Just like this man. Now we said earlier, in that day, there was an idea that if somebody was unrighteous, they would have this sickness. And I believe this man physically not being able to walk was a picture of what some people experienced spiritually. I believe some of us were not walking like we should with the Lord because we still have this kind of stigma over in our lives, like either I'm not good enough or there's this sin that I fell in and I can't be forgiven of it. And I believe the Lord would say to us this morning, you're forgiven. I have the power to do this. I have the power to set you free. Jesus' church can heal you. People today who are not walking spiritually because they are paralyzed by guilt over sin or a series of sins that took place in their lives spiritually, I think Jesus would say to you today, you can walk again. I think he would say to you this morning, spiritually, be of good cheer. It's time to get up. It's time for you to walk with me. You see, Jesus has power to banish sin, to banish sickness. And practically for you and I, it's no use taking your sins to a man or to a priest. We need to bring our sins to Jesus. We have to do that. We have to do that, whether it's anger, lying, if it's hypocrisy, if it's pride, if it's lust, if it's bitterness, anxieties. And obviously I could be up here all day giving you a list, but I won't, don't worry. A list of sins that you and I struggle with, that you've fallen into. But Jesus here, he's trying to help us understand. Guys, listen, Jesus has power to forgive us of our sins and to banish them, to get rid of them, to not just heal a man physically, not just to heal a woman physically, but to heal a man or a woman spiritually, guys. That's what the body of Christ is. It is a, a body of believers that have been saved by grace through faith, not of works. And God is doing a work changing us. And once we leave this life, can I say this? It's too late to be forgiven of our sins. Once we leave this life, it's too late to bring our sins to Jesus and say, Jesus, I heard that you could heal a paralytic. Jesus is here now saying, it's been appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. And you and I will either stand before God one day with our own righteousness and say, Lord, this is what I've done. These are all my good works. And we lay them down at his feet and we say, I hope it's enough to get me into heaven, which we're going to be very disappointed that day. Or we come before the Lord and we say, I've laid my sins at the feet of Jesus and I've received the gift of eternal life that he's given. Forgiveness. Because he has exousia power. He has the jurisdiction to deal with it, to write a presidential pardon and to say, forgiven once and for all. And that's what Jesus says to this man. He says, arise. He says, take up your bed and walk. I think for some of us, we need to just perceive this. And I think for some of us, we got to kind of just believe this and, and walk in this. I think it's time to just get up, to stop negotiating and talking about it and discussing it and thinking about it and theorizing on it and just arise. Just get up, man. You know, at the end of the day, as a dad, I shared with you at the beginning, I don't really care what it takes to get my kid out of bed. You know what I care? that they get out of bed. And then I care if they brush their teeth. I'll be honest. You know, I do care about that. And the Lord does too. He doesn't care what it takes. For some of us, we may be really spiritually inclined and the Lord may just whisper in our ear and we may just respond and follow him. But for some of us, it may take, you know, like a football action for God to wake us up. But at the end of the day, he doesn't care. He's looking, there you are. 
look at you. We're standing there. All our buttons are off. You know what I mean? We got food on our face. We're like, I'm awake. I'm here. And I was like, good. He said, now follow me and I'll make you a fisherman. I'll do this. But it's an act of faith. This is why religion can be so dangerous for God's people. I believe so many God's people, because of religious circles and religious ideas, they are still laying in their bed when Jesus is saying, listen, man, I didn't pick you because of how good you were. I picked you because I love you. I adopted you. You're my son. Now arise, take up your bed. It's time to walk. You know, there's an element of faith to this church. Even today, as I, I just... As I studied, I, I felt like I needed to say to you, will you arise? Will you begin to walk by faith? What does that mean? Remember I said earlier, Hebrews 11, 1, the word feeling is not in there. The guy who says, I'll do it when I feel like it, I got bad news for you. It's probably never going to happen because we're called to walk by faith. And faith is a substance and an evidence, meaning, well, I'm a Christian. What does that look like? Watch. <laughs> Watch what it looks like. It looks different. And I walk by faith. You know, will you cast your cares and anxieties on the Lord and believe that he's got you? You say, but I don't feel like he's got me. Okay. But will you cast your cares on the Lord and believe that he's got you and watch him carry you? Watch him take care of things. You know, as a pastor, I have never, I have still never seen the Lord, a man or woman who submits to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and says, God, I'm going to follow you. I have never, ever seen God fail. Not one time. Never. I haven't seen it yet. Maybe it'll happen one day. It won't. It won't happen. Never seen. I've seen God provide, take care, restore, bless, heal, <laughs> fix, save, change. Even the world goes on and goes, what happened to that guy? What'd you do to him? I didn't do anything. His name is Jesus. He heals, he fixes, he restores. But it's an act of faith. Will you ask him to overflow you with the spirit and believe that he has? Why? Because he keeps his promises. You know, some of us were saying, oh, I want more of God. Then ask him. And then walk out believing that he has. Why? Because he said he would. And if God said he would, he will. It's already finished. So if you say, Lord, fill me with your spirit, then walk through the day knowing I'm filled with the Holy Spirit today. Yeah, but I didn't do, you know, 5,000 spiritual exercises before I left. That has nothing, the Bible never says, if you do this many spiritual exercises before you leave, then you get the Holy Spirit. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, what son who would ask his father for an egg in the morning, would his father give him a rock? Or if he asked him for a fish, will he give him a scorpion? He says, how much more will the, will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who just ask? Just ask. Just walk with Him. Enjoy Him. Will you ask Him to help you create healthy habits? And then you know what? Walk by faith and get up in the morning <laughs> and go in His direction and do what God's Spirit is telling you to do. You know, the other day, I sensed the, I sensed the Lord telling me, just you know, my wife was making chicken noodle soup and I sent him tell me to, to, to do the chicken for her. And that's a big act for me. You know, that's like, that's big. That's like laying down my, now, I shouldn't be boasting about what I've done. Nine out of 10 times, I don't do it when the Lord tells me. But this one particular time I did, and you should have seen them, I had to call the paramedics. She fainted. You know, she didn't know what to do. She's like, what just happened? Oh, is this real? Oh, God. No, I'm just kidding. But will you? It's an act of faith. You don't feel like it, and then you do it, and you know what? You feel like it afterwards. You do. Will you today let Jesus forgive you for your sins? Will you believe that he has power to forgive sins, and he can wipe your slate clean and give you a new start with a new heart? You go, but I don't feel like it. Well, that has nothing to do with faith. It has to do with what Jesus Christ already did for you. You know, this whole chapter finishes with the multitudes watching this. You know, Jesus was the, was the greatest mind blower in history. The multitudes watched this. It says they marveled. The word phobos, it literally means it was like a fear on them. They glorified God and it says who had given such power to men. It's exousia. It's the only place the Bible really says that God gives exousia power. In Acts 1, for you Bible students, says it, it, God will give you power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's dunamis. But the exousia power, the authority we have, church, listen, 
The authority we have from God in this earth is only as forgiven men and women. That's it. When you and I walk out into this world as if we figured it out and we're like the A team of Christians, the exousia power, gone. The exousia power we have, listen, in marriage, listen, <laughs> in parenting, listen, church, it's as forgiven men and women. It's not you and I telling our kids, this is how you do it because daddy always has done this right. It's going, listen, bud, I get it. You know, I get it. But this is what the Bible says. You may stumble, you may fall, you may trip up sometimes, but you go to God and you ask him to forgive you and you know what he'll do every single time. He'll meet you there. It's us extending grace to our spouse because we realize I'm a forgiven man. I'm a forgiven woman. It's us at the workplace. One of the hardest places being a forgiven man, a forgiven woman, extending grace. And church, listen, what the Lord will do, that is when the power, man, it just goes out. It just happens. People begin to look at us. And all of a sudden we go, why are people taking notice of my walk with the Lord all of a sudden? Because there is exousia power going through us. And the reason why is because we are walking in the reality that, that the greatest of us, all we are, are forgiven men and women. We were paralyzed people that were brought to Jesus, that Jesus touched us, and he says, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Church, your sins are forgiven. This day, your sins are forgiven. Not because I say it, because Jesus said it. And if you're here and you have never said yes to Jesus, man, I couldn't urge you to do it more. Say, yeah, it's like I have the winning numbers for the lottery. And it's, a, you know, you don't have to pay for this ticket. You just receive it. It's true. It's true. There's so many evidences of this in this place here today. So many changed lives, families. Be forgiven. Whether you feel like it or not today, church, listen, arise. It's time to walk with the Lord. Enjoy him. Let God do a work in your family, in your marriage, with your children, in your communities, through your life, not because of how great you are, but as a forgiven man, as a forgiven woman. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to close in a song. Maybe you're here and you need to, you need to be reminded that you've been forgiven. You need it. You need to say to the Lord today, Lord, remind me that you've bought me, you've paid for me, you love me. <laughs> Maybe that's what happens. Maybe today somebody here needs to shed a tear and soften their heart and say, Lord, Lord God, please, I'm struggling. If that's you, do that today. Maybe you've put a burden on your back that Jesus never put there. And you're thinking, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. And the Lord's just saying, come to me. Come be forgiven, come be close to me. Let me do the work. Wherever you're at today, touch base with God as we close in this song. Why don't we stand?